Welcome back, everyone. You all know I'm a Stephen King fan, of his work at least. I try to ignore his online political rants, but his catalog of horror and suspense was an integral part of my childhood. And if you're also a Stephen King fan, then you know a lot of his early works take place within the fictional town of Castle Rock, Maine. Castle Rock was also the setting for The Dead Zone, Cujo, The Dark Half. It's also the setting of Stand By Me or the novella The Body. So when in 1991, the 700-page monster novel Needful Things was published and it was marketed as The Last Castle Rock, story, I was the first in line at my local bookstore. It is my favorite of all his novels, not because it's the scariest, like It, or the most apocalyptic, like The Stand, but because it is a complex book. There are so many threads that King had to pull on and tie together, so just in a technical sense, the book is an achievement. But more than that, the story revolves around the idea of corruption, how easy it can sometimes be to turn a good person bad. Now, if you've not read this book, of course, I highly suggest it. And like most works of Stephen King, this one was also optioned to become a movie. So in 1993, we get the release of the film adaptation of Needful Things. Okay, I know, it's not a faithful adaptation. I get the critics for this, but a two-hour film is never going to be able to adapt a 700-page novel to the exact letter of the word. Did I want to see the return of Kiefer Sutherland as Castle Rock scumbag Ace Merrill, the character he played in Stand By Me? Hell yes I did! Did I want to see Polly fight a giant spider? Sure, I was 17 years old, what 17 year old doesn't want to see that? Did I want to see the deeper and more tragic backstory of Sheriff Alan Pangborn included? It would have been nice, but not exactly necessary. But what we got was a fun film, one that could have used more setup and relationship and character building, but what we got was fun. It was in the spirit of Stephen King. Dark themes mixed with dark humor. Starring Ed Harris, Max von Sydow, J.T. Walsh, and Bonnie Bedelia, this was also the first film directed by Fraser Heston, son of the legendary Charles Heston. Now, if you want to see what is dubbed the director's cut, it is available on YouTube for free. It is 189 minutes long. It expands upon the threat of the main antagonist, Leland Gaunt, who is essentially the devil, other inhabitants of Castle Rock, and their motivations, as well as how they help cross over into other relationships that feed into the chaotic corruption that infects the community. And yes, if you ask me, I do prefer the longer version, which has flaws itself. The audio is edited. It does not have any of the profanity. It was originally aired on European TV as a miniseries, so they used a lot of the finished but unused footage from the film. And this is basically what you get. And yes, I watched the original, then I watched the extended cut, and just like Stephen King said himself, it works. It's great. Now, you can buy it on Blu-ray, but for the life of me, except for this non-4K version on YouTube, you cannot rent this extended cut online. If anyone knows of a place where you can rent it and stream it, do the rest of us a favor and put it in the comment section. I'll make sure to pin it at the top. But enough of the backstory of this film, let's get into the plot of Needful Things. But before we get to it, if you could take a moment to like, subscribe, comment, and share this video out, we really appreciate it. It helps out the channel each and every week. We open with a flyover of the coast of Maine towards Castle Rock, and then a 1958 Mercedes-Benz 300DW 189 automatic Adenor races down country roads past a sign that welcomes travelers to the town of Castle Rock. In the extended version, the same car races towards the town, but instead finds Sheriff Alan Pangborn and his deputy Norris Ridgwick on the side of the road with car trouble. It clips their rearview mirror and a six to seven minute car chase ensues and ends with the Mercedes in flames. But through those flames, Sheriff Pangborn thinks he sees the driver alive and well, almost mockingly watching him. Now, I will try to avoid describing too many of the differences between the two versions, otherwise it may cause some confusion. I'll just settle on a few key additions that I think make sense. We next meet Nettie Cobb as she peers out the window of the dot, the local diner. She is immediately suspicious of the new store opening up across the street. She is then startled by Sheriff Alan Pangborn as he arrives for his daily lunch. He's also greeted by Raider, Nettie's Rottweiler. Now, Alan enters and asks about Polly. Polly's the owner of the dot and also Alan's girlfriend. Today, Alan has a surprise, an engagement ring. As he orders, and before he can propose, Nettie interrupts him with a newspaper advertisement for Needful Things. You won't believe your eyes. You won't believe your eyes. This is the new store that has the town talking, but most dismiss it as just another antique store. Now, Alan does get a chance to propose, Polly accepts, but we then see how Polly's severe arthritis doesn't even allow her to put on a ring. In the book, Polly's a seamstress, which explains her chronic ailment, but here, she's just afflicted with it. We don't really get a backstory about it. Next, we're introduced to Brian Rusk, an 11-year-old boy riding his bike throughout town as he comes to a screeching halt at the new store. And as he walks up onto the porch, a single pane of glass is clean, allowing allowing whoever's inside to see out. Now, Brian hears a noise. It was the front door, and now a sign stating open has appeared. Brian accepts the invitation and goes inside. 
While inside, he finds out it's not quite ready. He calls out to anyone who's there, but no one answers. The shelves and floor are littered with unique and unusual items. Something to pay close attention to is that depending on the mood and identity of the customer, the rooms within Needful Things seem to know exactly what to show them to get them interested in bargaining. As well, the lighting is always filtered through a haze, either smoke or dust, or there's a source of fire lighting the room. Again, more clues to who our mystery proprietor really is. As Brian continues to look around, he's startled by a low, grumbly voice from the new owner, an elderly gentleman with a difficult to place accent. He tells Brian that his name is Leland Gunn. He says he thinks he remembers Brian, that he looks familiar, that they must have met before. And even though this is impossible, it just might be a hint that Mr. Gunn is something different. He tells Brian that everything in his shop is for sale, but not everything for sale is in the shop. He has a basement. He asks Brian what he wants most of all, to which Brian responds a 1956 Topps Mickey Mantle baseball card. He and his father collected all the 56 Yankees except that one. In the extended cut, Brian and Gaunt talk about how Brian's father left, but according to Mr. Gaunt, he didn't leave Brian. He left Brian's mother. And thus we begin to see how Leland Gaunt likes to manipulate people's points of view. As well, Leland Gaunt might have a little bit of omniscience about him, because how could he know that about Brian when they just met? Now, Mr. Gaunt returns with the item Brian requested, even signed to Brian himself, and as Brian touches it, he's transported back to 1956 and Old Yankee Stadium as Mantle hits a home run. After that, let the negotiations begin. Now, Brian only has about a dollar in change, but Mr. Gaunt says that the cash price will be set at that change in Brian's pocket, and the rest of the price will be a deed, a trick, a prank, and no one will ever know it was him. Leland sets Brian's sights on Wilma Jerzyk, a local turkey farmer with a surly disposition. Now, after Brian leaves, Leland opens up his notebook. We see a list of names. Some of them are crossed out with the heading Port Elizabeth. And then the fourth name down is Nelson Mandela, the famous activist and politician. Now, does this have any bearing on the film? No, it's just a fun little Easter egg to point out that Nelson Mandela happens to be on Leland Gaunt's list. The next page he flips to is a list titled Akron, and then flips again to a blank page, scrawls out the name Castle Rock at the top, and then the name Brian Rusk. This act seems to give Leland a great deal of satisfaction. We then get to meet Norris Ridgwick, Alan's right-hand man and town deputy, as he practices his police voice in the mirror, and then we meet Dan Forth Keaton, who Norris calls Buster. Why? Well, although it's not explained, Buster Keaton is a legendary silent film star, much in the guise of Charlie Chaplin. From here on in, we shall also call Danforth Buster, and if you care to know, Buster is my favorite character in the entire film, and portrayed magnificently by one of the most underrated character actors of all time, J.T. Walsh. May he rest in peace. And Buster is also the town selectman. Buster grabs Norris and assaults him because Norris wrote Buster a ticket for being parked in the handicap space. Norris also calls him Buster, and this makes the situation even worse. Their argument and fight spill out into the hallway of the police station. Alan intervenes, and we get a little bit of the backstory for Alan. He moved from a big city to a small town to get away from the madness, but these two just prove to him that everybody is crazy everywhere. He then tells the two to just fight it out. Whoever kills the other will be thrown in jail and he then leaves. We then cut to Polly, encouraging Nettie to cross the street and welcome Mr. Gaunt to the neighborhood. She has one of her delicious apple pies with her. She also has her dog, Raider. Nettie reluctantly goes forth and almost gets run over, and as Nettie makes her way, Leland is busy with a packed store of clients, including Wilma Jerzyk, who asks about an antique wood chisel. At that moment, Nettie enters, and Leland states that he didn't think they'd had room in there for another soul. We find out, as Raider barks at Wilma, that Wilma hates Nettie mostly because of Raider. And Nettie is somewhat disturbed, not just by Wilmer, but she also suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. To settle the situation down, Mr. Gaunt then speaks German to Raider that gets him to sit and be quiet. I tried translating it, but I wasn't successful, nor is it in the original script, so maybe a last minute improv decision. Wilma leaves in a huff, Nettie is left all alone, and the store takes this moment to show her what she wants the most, a porcelain figurine. Leland enters again, tells Nettie that she can have it at a price. Nettie initially refuses, but as he holds it, she's brought back to the memory of her husband George, who used to beat her, and during those beatings, broke all of her figurines. Like I said earlier, apparently Mr. Gaunt is also partially omniscient. He knows things about people, including that Nettie is the one who murdered her husband, most likely in self-defense. And from here, Nettie becomes one of our most sympathetic characters, next to Brian, of course. And that's the thing about Castle Rock. As sympathetic as all these characters are, it seems that everyone is tainted in some way to varying degrees. It's a perfect place for the devil to set up shop. Now, King called him a demon, Leland calls himself Satan, and in the book, he is a possible multi-dimensional being. Either way, the guy's evil. 
Now, Nettie leaves without purchasing anything, but she also senses something about Mr. God that reminds her about her dead husband. So in a way, Nettie has her own way of sensing people's true intentions, or at least sensing true evil. Now, before Wilma and her husband can return to their turkey farm, Brian Rusk arrives to perform his deed for Mr. Gaunt, which is to gather up a bucket of turkey shit and smear it all over Wilma's white linen laundry. And as Brian does this, we are intercut with Sheriff Pangborn meeting with Leland Gaunt for the first time. He tells Mr. Gaunt that he doesn't need anything. He has everything he needs already. The two converse over a piece of Nettie's pie. Gaunt seems to recognize Alan the same way he recognized Brian earlier, but of course, how could that be possible? Alan explains how he got from Pittsburgh to Castle Rock, how he lost his temper once with a suspect in custody, and Mr. Gaunt seems to encourage that kind of behavior. But then Alan asks about Mr. Gaunt's whereabouts and where he's from, and he tells him he's from Akron, Ohio. This scene is innocuous from the outside. But it feels like two warriors sizing each other up, declaring their intentions, and letting the other know that, that neither will back down, that this conflict will go to distance. And it is clear that Alan, who is the underdog because he does not possess the information Gaunt has, is extremely suspicious of Gaunt's true intentions in his town. Appropriately enough, we then dissolve to a church steeple. The local Protestant pastor, Reverend Rose, defaces the Catholic Church's announcement board with a bumper sticker that correlates gambling with devil worship. He conceals the other materials he has in his hand as Alan walks by to meet with the Catholic priest, Father Meehan. Father Meehan is called the sheriff because of a threatening letter sent by the concerned men of the local Baptist church that insults the Catholic faith, its followers, and its plans to hold a charity night of gambling. Nothing like ancient religious hatred to wind people up, and Father Meehan is wound up for a fight as Alan tries to calm him down. Speaking of winding people up, Wilma and her husband have returned home. Wilma walks straight into the shit-covered sheets. Now she is shit-covered too. Immediately she thinks of Nettie Cobb, who at the time is closing up the dot by herself for the very first time. The phone rings, it's for Nettie. On the other end is Wilma, still covered in shit, and she tells Nettie that her revenge will be killing Radar. This sends Nettie into a fit. Now, so far we have Buster and Norris, Wilma and Nettie, Father Meehan and Pastor Rose, and we have Brian Rusk biking around like a flying monkey doing Gaunt's dirty deeds. I think it's safe to say that Gaunt chose fertile ground to sow. By the way, that last comment, fertile ground to sow, was on purpose. The etymology of the name Leland is untilled ground or unfarmed ground, just in case you wanted to know. I knew that literature and English undergrad degree would come in handy one day. Meanwhile, the local bar, the Mellow Tiger, owned and operated by Henry Beaufort, is busy. We meet Hugh Priest, the town drunk and maintenance man for Castle Rock's public works. And sitting at the bar is Wilma's husband, Pete. And this is understandable. We've all met Wilma already. If I were Pete, I'd be at the bar drinking too. And Buster is there going over horse racing schedules. Hugh is drunk, but he's also annoyed that the jukebox is skipping and the song that is skipping is Achy Breaky Heart. And really, can anyone blame him at that point? He kicks the jukebox, even though Henry tells him not to. He does it another couple of times and defines. Henry takes his keys and cuts Hugh off. We learn that Buster seems to loathe most of, if not all of the people at Castle Rock as he insults Hugh. But then we also learn that Buster, he might not be all right in the head. He talks to Henry as he stares directly in the mirror behind the bar. Do it at night, they come in and they take out the mirrors and they put in a piece of one-way glass and they stick a camera on the other side of it. And they watch you and they laugh at you. And they take down every single word you say. So yeah, I think it's safe to say Buster is a little mentally unhinged, functionally unhinged, but unhinged nonetheless. Since Hugh was cut off, he ends up walking home in the rain. His path brings him by needful things, and in the front window is a replica of Hugh's old high school varsity jacket, his name stitched into it and all. He enters the store, meets a sympathetic Mr. Gaunt, and of course, the store knows what Hugh needs, high school glory back again when he was actually somebody in the town. The two work out a deal which involves Mr. Gaunt brandishing a hunting knife for Hugh to take with him, and of course we can only guess what that's going to be used for. Mr. Gaunt opens his little black book again to write down Hugh's name. We see that his list has grown. Brian Rusk we know about, then Nettie Cobb, Wilma Jerzyk, and Cora Rusk, Brian's mom who had 95% of her story cut from the theatrical release. Now, we're left to guess a little bit because we haven't seen Nettie take anything from Mr. Gaunt or make any deal, or Wilma, or Cora. We barely see her in the film at all. Now, in the director's cut, Cora, whose husband walked out on her, became obsessed with Elvis. Her needful thing in the extended cut was a marble bust of the king and a pair of his sunglasses, which you see her wearing in two of her scenes later on. She might as well be out of Brian's life at this point too. As much as his father, she's an absentee mom. But there you have it, the list continues to grow. The next day, Reverend Rose enters the shop to ask about placing a flyer in Mr. Gaunt's front window, the one that asks you to say no to the devil. Mr. Gaunt is limber in his evasion of the matter and then offers Reverend Rose an item from what looks like art and 
antiquity of a very sexualized nature from all over the world. It seems that Reverend Rose is okay with this. He gets his purchase, he leaves, but passes Father Meehan on the way who sees a beautiful chalice in the window that calls out to him. It seems that Leland Gaunt's business is very, very good at this point. The day concludes with Mr. Gaunt handing out items to Myra, the other waitress at the dot, and a first edition Treasure Island signed by Robert Louis Stevenson to the high school principal Frank Jewett. However, Gaunt is getting very confident and playful now as he warns Mr. Jewett that he has a tendency to turn up the heat. That night, as Polly Chalmers locks up the dot, she is startled by Leland sitting at a table that he was not sitting at a second before. He asks for a cup of coffee and introduces himself. He tells Polly that he knows about her arthritis and then wonders if she has a donut or anything else for him to dunk. And yes, he means exactly what you think. This scene ends with Brian Russ standing in the dark outside the diner staring at Leland. Meanwhile, Alan is at Buster's Marina, Buster's used boat business. Buster was just watching the horse races, apparently he lost big time. Alan explains that the state auditors called and want printouts of their town spending. Buster admits to Alan that he's had a tough time at the track, blames his stealing from the town petty cash fund, $20,000, to cover his losses, is to protect his relationship with his wife Myrtle, and promises to pay it back in four days. Alan gives him those four days, a chance for him to make it right. It just shows that Alan's a good guy and wants to believe the best in people. The only problem so far with this whole scenario is that Polly sees this and becomes suspicious. Now this part of Alan and Polly's relationship is not visited in depth, but the extended cut has a lot more dedicated to this conflict that Gaunt helps initiate. The whole dealing of trust or lack of trust between two people who are looking to spend the rest of their lives together. Now the next morning Brian's at the lighthouse and Gaunt arrives to let him know that the dealing is not yet done until Mr. Gaunt says the dealing is done. We dissolve from this scene to Buster and Mr. Gaunt playing an antique Japanese wind-up horse racing game. That's right, say that three times fast. Gaunt explains to Buster that the game is special. If you whisper the names of the real horses and touch the game, then play the game, it will predict the winners and you can rake in the goddamn cash. Add another name for Gaunt's list. We then see the lunch crowd filing into dots. Wilma enters and we get some not so veiled threats against Raider towards Nettie, who then runs out only to be comforted by Leland, and we do not know what is said, but Nettie begins to laugh. And what's interesting here is that we just saw Leland in his store selling to Buster. Now we see Leland here in the diner. One could say it's just a cut in time between two scenes, or one can make the argument that maybe Leland is more than omniscient and he's able to be in more than one place at the same time. And as Leland makes Nettie feel better, Buster comes home and while locked in his office, he plays out each horse race on the winning ticket game. Myrtle, his wife, asks if he wants anything, but really Buster just wants to be left alone with his addiction and his obsession. And as Myrtle leaves, we also see Nettie leaving her house and also leaving Raider behind. And still it's a busy day for the customers of Needful Things because Brian is once again riding toward Wilmer and Pete's turkey farm, this time with a crate of apples. Pete is with the turkeys and cannot hear a thing above all the gobbles and squawks of the hundreds of birds. This gives Brian time and solitude to pitch every green apple into the windows of Wilma's kitchen. He absolutely destroys everything in the room. Every window is broken, every appliance and every knickknack is in pieces. When Brian realizes the damage he's done, he flees in panic. Now we're about to get our first death in Castle Rock because of Leland Gaunt. Hugh needs to complete his deed for Mr. Gaunt, his prank to kill Raider. And as Raider meets his fate, Nettie enters Buster's house to plaster it with fake traffic tickets all signed by Norris Ridgwick. Some of the tickets cite Buster for stealing and embezzling town funds, other accuse him of cornholing his mother. You get the idea. Nettie only stops when she sees another recipe for perfect apple pie, and this is when Buster leaves his office and finds his home's interior littered with pink slips. Nettie's able to escape and ride home, but she's in for a terrible shock. Raider does not come to her when he's called. She hears a creaking noise coming from inside the closet. She opens it and is horrified at the sight of what is left of her dog, skinned and hung up with a rope. At this point, Nettie's cracked, and she immediately suspects Wilma Jersey. Speaking of crack, Wilma comes home a little later on to find her house in shambles. It is almost a total loss for everything, and green apples are rolling around all over the floor. For Wilma, this is a sign it has to have been Nettie Cobb. And as Wilma surveys the damage, she grabs a meat cleaver. She turns to see Nettie standing in her kitchen. Nettie has a kitchen knife behind her back, and the two decide to have it out once and for all, and they basically beat the crap out of each other. There are flesh wounds and face kicks up until the final collision, which sends both of them out the second floor window. The impact forcing the knife through Nettie and the meat cleaver into Wilma's head, all of this in front of a mortified Pete. For Mr. Gaunt, again, business is very good, as he checks their names off his list while talking to Polly. He has asked her to come by. He has a gift for her. Meanwhile, police sirens can be heard in the background as Castle Rock's finest race to the Jersey farm. But if Mr. Gaunt wanted to be undisturbed with Polly, his hopes are dashed as Buster rushes in looking haggard and frazzled. 
Mr. Gaunt sends him upstairs to wait as he gives Polly an ancient Egyptian necklace. Inside the pendant, he cannot say, but it immediately takes away Polly's crippling pain, and her vision as the necklace touches her skin is of her and Mr. Gaunt passionately kissing in bed. Of course, I think we all know the bargain Mr. Gaunt wants to cut with Polly at this point. Alan is unaware of Polly's whereabouts at this time because he's busy trying to figure out what happened at the Jersey farm, and as he does this, Gaunt and Buster speak upstairs. Buster is armed with a pistol, Gaunt takes it away and tells Buster that Alan Pangborn is the ringleader, the leader of them, and that he should drink and gamble and throw everyone off their game, make it look like nothing's wrong and nothing's bothering him, but infers that soon Buster's time will come. Now back at the Jersey farm, Brian Rusk asks to talk to the sheriff. The sheriff asks if he knows who threw the apples that litter the crime scene. Brian says no. The sheriff tells him to go home then, and as Brian leaves, he runs into Mr. Gaunt, and Alan sees this. In the extended cut, Gaunt gives Brian a gift and instructions, which makes sense later on. But also again, here's another example of Leland was just at Needful Things. Now he's at the crime scene. Can he be in multiple places at multiple times? Now you would think that all the conflict would end there at the Jersey farm, but it doesn't because Father Meehan and Pastor Rose are having dueling last rites over the dead bodies, each disrespecting each other's religion. The next day, the police meet to discuss the case. Alan voices his suspicions about others being involved and decides to go see Brian Rusk. As well, Norris has found a knife that was used on Raider and will run it for Prince. Alan gives 10 to 1 odds that they are not Wilma Jerzyk's. As Norris goes to leave the station, he sees a gift left for him. He puts his hand inside to see what it is and snap, it's a mousetrap with a note that leads him to believe that Buster left that gift. We next see Sheriff Pangborn find Brian hiding under the cliffside docks. Alan approaches him. He wants to know what Brian was trying to tell him last night. Brian says it doesn't matter anymore, that he has to go now and he has to go to hell. And he pulls out the gift that God gave to him, Buster's loaded pistol, and places it against his temple. Alan tries everything to calm Brian down as the young boy describes Mr. Gaunt as a monster. Poison place, and he's a poison man. Alan picks up the Mickey Mantle baseball card Brian first bargained for now lying on the dirty stairs. Brian yells out Mickey Mantle sucks and pulls the trigger. Fortunately, Alan is quick enough to save the boy's life, but he's still critically wounded. Now, it is time for the rest of the town to pay their debts to Mr. Gaunt. Father Meehan slashes Hugh Priest's tires. Henry kicks Hugh out again from the Mellow Tiger for the same behavior as before. Buster sits at the bar and warns everyone that they're going to get what is coming to them. And yes, that is Brian's mom drinking away her sorrows while wearing Elvis's glasses next to him. Hugh, after being thrown out in the rain, sees his slashed tires and for some reason thinks it's Henry, the bar owner, who did it. He goes to Mr. Gaunt, who gives us the biggest reveal of his identity yet as he hands Hugh a pump action shotgun with which to kill Henry. And it seems that Mr. Gaunt has an armory available for anyone who wants it, including loads of explosives. Gaunt states, I've been in this business a long time now. When I started out, I was just a poor wandering peddler moving across the blind face of a distant land. Moving, always moving, always gone. Asia, Anatolia, Palestine, Macedonia, year after year, and in the end, I'd always offer weapons. And they always bought. Of course, I was gone before they realized what they'd finally purchased. Hugh responds, Jesus. Gaunt answers, The young carpenter from Nazareth? I knew him well. A promising young man. He died badly. It is my favorite scene in the entire film. It is performed so well by Max von Sydow. In fact, his whole performance was playful, dramatic, comedic when it needed to be. He is the perfect corrupting force in the disguise of a man giving you exactly what you asked for. And as Hugh gets armed up, Alan meets up with Polly. Alan tells her about Brian and then about Gaunt, his suspicions that Gaunt is somehow behind all the trouble of late. Then he sees Polly's necklace and his behavior begins to widen the trust divide between the two. He wants her to get rid of it. She wants to keep it because it gets rid of her pain. Alan then receives a phone call. He had Norris checking on Gaunt's life in Akron, Ohio, but it seems there never was a Leland Gaunt in Akron, Ohio. Alan has had enough. He goes to confront Gaunt at Needful Things, which is already packed up and practically empty. I say practically because the building is littered with old newspapers, so old that Gaunt could not have collected them all, most announcing the most significant and violent events in history. The inference is that Gaunt is somehow associated with them all. An interesting deleted scene occurs here as Alan finds a small tapestry on the wall. There is a phrase written in Latin, and the best translation I can perform is, quote, and he brought alive a terrible boar. And biblically, the most accepted occurrence of the word boar is in Psalms 80, 13, when wild boars hunt humans. And of course, the word boar is also interchangeable with the word beast, a common word associated with the devil himself. But again, it was deleted, probably because the filmmakers understood that most American audiences wouldn't be able to translate that on the fly. 
After this, Alan makes his way to the basement, and although Alan does not find it, we see that there's enough plastic explosive to blow up anything surrounding the now abandoned store. And of course, Gaunt won't let this chance go to waste. Alan is away. Polly is home getting ready for bed and tries to open the Egyptian pendant. It falls to the floor and her pain returns worse than ever before. As she crawls towards it, Gaunt appears and places it back on our neck, lies to her about how Alan and Buster have been laundering money from the town, feeding into her suspicions, and then gets the final price for the necklace from Polly. Meanwhile, as Polly and Gaunt complete their deal, Alan returns to police headquarters, he shows Norris the newspapers he's found, and tries to explain that Gaunt is behind everything. This is when Polly calls him, she's on his boat, and has found piles of cash, just like Gaunt said she would. Alan tries to convince her that it's not his, and he goes to find her. However, it's not that easy. Before they can go, Buster rams his Cadillac into Norris's yellow VW bug, and it is clear that Buster has completely broken down mentally at this point. He and Norris fight it out, but Norris's hand is still hurt from the mousetrap, giving Buster the chance to best him, when Alan intercedes and knocks him back against the car. He cuffs Buster to the door handle and orders Norris to throw him in jail. Alan takes off, but Norris, instead of following orders, takes his chance to play a joke on Buster with an empty revolver. Buster kicks Norris in the mommy and daddy button, slams him headfirst into the car, and taunts him as he lies unconscious. As this occurs, Alan has made his way to his boat. There's no Polly, but he sees the piles of cash and the engagement ring he gave Polly a few days ago. We cut back to Buster, still handcuffed, pulling his car into his garage, where he incessantly honks the horn and screams for Myrtle to come and help him. She arrives, completely puzzled by the scene, Buster insults her and makes her retrieve a screwdriver and hammer. Once free, his paranoia turns on Myrtle, and he accuses her of sleeping with Norris just to embarrass him. And in a fit of final defiance, she calls him Buster. So he really has no choice at this point, he bludgeons her to death with the hammer. Inside the house, he washes off the blood, smashes the mirror because they are still looking at him, and then Gaunt calls. Buster has some confusion about what he's done, but Gaunt ensures him Danforth Keaton would never do anything to anyone who didn't deserve it. And sometimes we must hurt the ones we love. Besides, Buster still has work to do. Speaking of work, Hugh enters the Mellow Tiger and says hello to Henry and fires a shotgun into the jukebox. Henry says hello to Hugh as he raises his own shotgun from behind the bar. There's a momentary standoff, then they blast each other in a double homicide. We then see the aftermath as Alan and Norris process the crime scene. Alan is adamant that Gaunt is behind everything and goes to talk to the one man who can give him real insight, Father Meehan. But before he can, we see Buster burying explosives behind the church. He's also speaking to God, which enrages Gaunt because Buster is on his time now, not God's. Alan arrives at the front of the church a few minutes later. He asks Father Meehan about the devil. What does he look like? And tells him about his theories concerning Gaunt. But Father Meehan won't have it. He turns to Alan and tells him that Leland Gaunt is a decent man. Alan realizes at this point, even the church has become infected with Gaunt's evil. Father Meehan screams that the only one evil in Castle Rock is that damn Reverend Willie Rose. And with that, the bomb Buster planted in the cemetery explodes, destroying the Catholic Church. Alan and Father Meehan survive, and as Father Meehan storms off to find Reverend Rose, Alan looks out the back of the church to see Leland Gaunt casually sitting on his banister, smoking a cigar, and smiling. Out front, Father Meehan curses God, and a lightning bolt strikes the church steeple. The town is now in full riot mode, looting, destruction, personal grudge matches being settled in the streets. Alan grabs his shotgun, and we learn that the Baptist church is also on fire. We see a car ram into a truck. It's Principal Jewett. He's used his car to attack a man that he thinks stole his needful thing, that first edition copy of Treasure Island. After settling that dispute, Sheriff Pangborn then goes to stop some looters. And after that, we are then presented with a sniper's gun sights following him as Norris arrives to help. And as the two try to figure out how to proceed, a random citizen firebombs a local market. And as our two lawmen get up, we hear the beginning of the long awaited fight between a priest and a reverend. Father Meehan gets the better of Rose, and as he prepares to kill him, Sheriff Pangborn pulls his weapon. Gaunt, still watching, encourages Alan to shoot. He says, kill them all, let God sort them out. However, Alan does not let Gaunt manipulate him. He fires his entire clip into the air in frustration, causing the entire community to stop and look at what they've done. Gaunt's only response, what a wussy. The sheriff then speaks to his community. He pulls back the veil of corruption that Gaunt has placed over them, and they begin to come clean as to what they did for their needful things. Gaunt argues that he does not make people do anything. He merely shows people what he has to sell, and he lets them make up their own mind. But at this moment, Gaunt is done in Castle Rock. And as Alan tells him as much, a shot rings out, hitting him in the shoulder. Buster appears holding the sniper rifle. And to make matters worse, he's wrapped in explosives and prepared to kill everyone in town. But Buster is still conflicted as Alan tries to talk him down. He killed his Myrtle, 
and he really loved her, but gone, desperate for a final win, eggs Buster on, making the mistake of calling him Buster multiple times. In a moment of clarity, Buster turns and walks up the stairs of Needful Things. He stands in front of Leland Gaunt and tells him, Don't call me Buster. He then tackles Gaunt through the front window, detonating all of the explosives. Needful Things goes up in a massive fireball, and as Alan, Norris, and Polly look over the destruction, movement appears in the fire. It is Leland Gaunt. He is unharmed and he tells Alan that this was not his best work, but that Alan and Polly will get married, and that he should tell his grandson Bob that the two of them will meet in Jakarta, 2053, August 14th, 10 a.m., a nice sunny day. They'll make history. And with that, Leland takes his leave of Castle Rock. He gets into his Mercedes, which appears out of nowhere, and dries off. The film ends as it began, with a flyover of the main coastline and the question, who knows where Leland Gaunt will end up next. There are references to him in other King's work, The Body, It Grows On You, the Castle Rock TV series, but he never takes center stage again like he does in this monumental work by the master of horror. Maybe one day, we will be visited by him once again. Is Needful Things a perfect movie? No, it's not. It's a really fun movie, one that picks away at the frailties of human nature, and one that gives us one of Stephen King's greatest antagonists in all of his works. And that's what I think. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Did you enjoy this film? And what Stephen King movie adaptation is your favorite? Or which novel would you like to see hit the big screen in the future? As always, I thank you for watching. And remember, I'm still your reluctant gringo from south of the border. Salud and a huevo.